Thank you, Roberto, for showing us so well why computers will never be able to take the place of a true scholar. There's no chance. Uh, so we talked today about automating some of the things uh, we want to do uh, in, in science and in, in scholarship, but a lot of the anxiety that this work sometimes generates is unjustified and nobody can do anything like the presentation we have seen. Mm -hmm. Now, Put it on, uh, yes, I will. In fact, the, the, the peacock and the fireworks comparisons are, I think, in a place that there is no way. I, I wouldn't know how. Uh, but um, um, I remember the last time we gave this presentation in Emory, there was a similar setting to now because at the same time, uh, Salman Rushdie was speaking on campus, on the next building, <laughs> and we had a enough, <laughs> enough. And we felt sorry for him. We felt sorry for Salman Rushdie. Full audience in our Indeed, uh, yes. Yeah. So we are having fun. And uh, uh, what I will present now is part of this uh, five years ERC advanced grant that is called Think Big. And the Think Big idea is how we deal with large amounts of data. Not just how we process it, which will be boring for you and for me, it is very boring too, but how do we make sense of large amounts of data. And as we move towards a more and more data-driven way of life, how we make sure this doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt anyone. So there are consequences for society and scholarship as we start moving towards exploitation of large amounts of data. That's major concern for me. But today we just talk about the bright side, which is how can modern data technology help in a question of understanding the content of media. And for me, it's even a bit, one more step is, could we understand the culture and society and history by using uh, high throughput methods? Now, these are methods that uh, we have come to, to uh, know very well from the bioinformatics studies, genomic studies of the past 10, 15 years. And uh, in that domain, we have become used to very large scale acquisition of data, entire genomes being sequenced in a short time, entire uh, expression levels of all the genes in an organism done on a very vast scale. The high throughput idea of acquisition of data and processing of data was really first demonstrated in action in, in genomics. So it is not surprising that five years ago somebody attempted to use the same ideas on, on the text uh, and the content of books and they called it culture omics. This omics um, uh, suffix has been seen in biology a lot, proteomics, and genomics and uh, uh, transcriptomics, uh, th there is so much there. It is being abused, of course, it's out of fashion now. Uh, and it's surprising that paper because they talk about omics and high throughput, which is what today people would call big data, another big buzzword that is just waiting to be, to become out of fashion tomorrow. And, uh, and, and so forget buzzwords and just think about the notion. We can today acquire vast amounts of data and we can ask interesting questions to it. Something that Roberto has shown us well. So the five W's, who is doing what? where and when. Can we get this information out of text? Of course we can, we can read. Can a machine do it? Yes, machines can do it very well. Um, how can we use this? Well, how about reading every single newspaper article written today in the world? Why not? There used to be a time in which people were studying mass observation in the UK. That was the idea of monitoring everything that has been done and said on a specific day, like 11th of May, 1937, mass observation. That was an, uh, one way to do large scale analysis, right? Um, how about history? How about getting every newspaper every read, ever written, ever printed, and studying that? Why not? So that sort of crazy hubristic approach is really something we have come to enjoy in, in biology. You know, why not taking every genome? of every species ever existed, including extinct ones. Why not? So that kind of approach, I think, is, is interesting. And uh, 
uh, many questions in, 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 uh, in history and culture and society can, can, be, can be addressed starting from this perspective, as Alberto has shown. But keep in mind, text is only one thing. Uh, there was a paper two weeks ago studying uh, popular music over 50 years, actually starting from the files of the songs. And that was very exhaustive. It was pretty much every song in the top 100 in every year for 50 years. Fully automated study. I mean, analysis, then there are interpretation levels, but the study was very automated, of course. You cannot do it by hand. Speech. You can plug it, your software into the radio and listen to the radio full time, constantly analyze the contents, music, images. In fact, I will show you some images too. So, this doesn't mean that uh, we try to get machines to take the job of good scholars, but we want these people to not be wasting their time with filling forms and coding, coding papers when they can actually think bigger and bigger ideas. So, test bed. How do we try these ideas, these concepts? Well, we started doing this 10 years ago, so well before the paper on, on science. Uh, we thought that a good test bed is newspapers, just because they are neat, organized, still free text, but professionally written, easy to obtain. So we started from newspapers. The ideas actually transferred to everything. We built a, a software infrastructure to collect the content of news every day, actually every hour now, from um, about a thousand newspapers. Um, we are also analyzing the contents of Twitter, and uh, we are going to see some. We have moved now to the analysis of images, and we'll see something about the images as well. Um, you know, questions are so many. How does the media system work? Where do the ideas come from? Who starts a new fad, a new fashion, a new buzzword? Which way they travel? You can start asking questions, you know. And if you collect the public opinion, then social media, how is public opinion affected by media content? So we, we will try to answer some of them. Here is uh, the Roberto Franzosi moment of this presentation. Um, I also like this kind of slide. I met Roberto in Venice in a, in a meeting organized by a common friend. And, uh, the Shannon Conference. Shannon Conference. Oh, I can see an interesting connection. And then I was talking about uh, information in, in the newspapers, but uh, Roberto was focused on finding subjects and verbs and objects, beginning the five W's from there. Uh, it was because of that meeting, I suppose, that I met uh, Giuseppe in a meeting in London uh, and then uh, in Istanbul. Bec I went to London because of Roberto and then I went to Istanbul because of that meeting. So things, you know, have a way of happening that you cannot program and you cannot organize a large scale infrastructure for, you just have to follow these things. So here is the king sees the premier, subject, verb, object, who does what, who meets whom. Uh, newspapers are full of these things. Luckily, these are narrative texts. They don't discuss too much abstractions. They really say this person met this person and this person killed this other person. It's very, luckily, it's very simple language in, in most newspapers. Journalists are trained to declare the basic events at the top in a clear, in a clear form. So we try to identify subjects and objects with the actors of the narrative and the verbs with the action. Of course, there are many subtle things Sometimes the object is not a person, and then should you call it an, an actor or not? And these are lots of serious things. But for the point of view of this presentation, we just want to get these triplets on a large scale. Another triplet here. So how well can machines today find those triplets? You see Roberto's uh, pictures and animations were based, I suppose, mostly on hand-typed uh, information. Somebody was hand probably. You know something <laughs> about it, yeah. yeah. Uh, they both work on you, you know how uh, what it means, right? So, um, well, in part, it's nice to do it. I enjoy when I do some of the tasks by hand, but there is a moment after which it's best if they're done by somebody else. So, but the point is not only because you get tired, you can ask different questions. You can operate on different languages. You can start scaling up in real time, for example. You can get triplets as they are pronounced in a speech. So these things are no longer possible if you don't have computational infrastructures. So here is a study about news content. Uh, we've done a bunch of those since, since, but this is something I want to put because it's fairly 
large. So this has to do with the, how the contents of the global media system reacted to the Fukushima <coughs> accident. This is going to work with Giuseppe, I should mention. How did the media react to the Fukushima accident? Well, on the March 11, there was a, an explosion. There was a triple whammer. There was a, a, an earthquake, a tsunami, and then a nuclear meltdown. So three things happened in, 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 in a sequence. You can imagine the media reacted, public opinion reacted. A lot of things changed because of that. Uh, and now you could say, I, we really want to understand how this happened. And you just have to get funding and get uh, a way to collect 5 million newspaper articles and convince your collaborators to code 5 million articles. Uh, but uh, Roberto could convince anybody to do anything. So probably they, they would do it. Uh, but we thought, this is just English language. So we first filtered articles from the newspapers in that year, that were in those years that were about science. Within that subset, we focused on those um, that uh, discussed nuclear power. Uh, so these are five years and a half, and a bit, yeah. We isolated by machine the science ones. Then we started. Um, coding them, so to speak. Now, this was not specific for nuclear power. Our pipeline software infrastructure was able to identify every topic, every type of uh, science, every type of disease, every academic institution. Everything was fully coded in the first pass on five million documents. But if you take just nuclear power, you can see how many times just the two words nuclear power are mentioned, just to start with. And you see that it was always discussed, of course. And then on this day, there is an increase in attention, then there are various other aftershocks, and then it goes back to normal. So that moment is the moment of the accident. If you now start looking at the world surrounding nuclear power and uh, assess a measure in the amount of sentiment, positive or negative words, you can make a list of such words, you can plot sentiment surrounding nuclear power. And this is a lasting change in the sentiment. <coughs> the text surrounding nuclear power changes color, changes mood after this day. It doesn't come back, by the way. So there has been a global shift in the way we think about or we talk about nuclear power in the media uh, on that day. Uh, and because we can find a clear change point, we can talk about before and after, we can play um, the, uh, the same narrative analysis game before and after. Uh, before that, let's just look for named entities. These are people and locations and organizations, or maybe in this case diseases and uh, topics of science. We can just extract all this and see how they associate. So before, <coughs> nuclear power was uh, um, associated with, uh, I don't know, nuclear engineering and nuclear physics in terms of science. Uh, I don't know why, but the University of Virginia and these kind of things. After a major new concept shows up, thyroid cancer. In the narrative of the media, nuclear power is now associated to thyroid cancer, for example, and another cancer here. So that's a new topic that shows up. In fact, the frame changed. You can see nuclear power as uh, in the framework of uh, reducing emissions and meeting the targets for Kyoto, and that's the solution to a problem. You can see it as giving you thyroid cancer, then it's a problem. Depends how you tell the story. So this is the first one. I should have done the zoom before. You know, there are uh, technical, maybe financial aspects to it. Then there are medical elements to nuclear power. But this is just associations, co-occurrences of two concepts. You can also look at narratives, subject, verbs, and object. That's what Roberto has shown us before and after. Now we are going to zoom. Before, nuclear power, I don't know, I can't see so close, but um, um, the Obama administration promote nuclear power. Or labor want nuclear power. Or you could see nuclear power offers possibilities. The arrow depends. Um, Venezuela needs nuclear power. And so on, you know. Um, nuclear power makes sense. You have this 
triplets. And, uh, and they're interesting, and they can be giving you a quick summary of how the topic is, is described after the accident. Then everything changes. Tokyo abandons nuclear power. Solar power replaces nuclear power. And then you would have uh, plants, uh, nuclear power closed plants. Or you would have um, nuclear power causes deaths. Uh, some others are still, you know, China wants nuclear power. But you would have Germany and Italy, uh, Germany drop nuclear power. Um, Italy was one of those who dropped it. I forgot if it's here, but um, yes, yes. can you find it somewhere? Right, right, right. right. There you go, scrap. So, and nearly all countries reconsider. Reconsider, power. drop, scrap, yeah. yeah. So you can see that the story ha is changed, and that probably explains why the yeah. sentiment has changed. So you can have a quick understanding of what the global media system has as is saying today as what has changed in, in as a consequence of this event by just drawing these diagrams that, that Roberto uh, introduced. And this would be done on 5 million, but our system could have done it on 20 million, would have been the same, because by now we can do very large scale. Um, so then you can take the verbs. Now you know what the verb is because you parsed. If you know the verbs, you can start looking at the verb clouds, no longer word clouds. So these are the actions relative nuclear power. I think in this case, nuclear power is the object of these verbs. Embrace, consider, support, want, and need. After, abandon, oppose, but also promote and embrace. So, you know, you can see what people say about it. Reject, pursue, champion, you know, a discussion. So that allows you to, to have a large scale, and that's when I mentioned uh, maybe uh, machines can do the marking of the essays for you, maybe one day, so you don't have to spend all your time. You know. So long as they say the right words in the right amount, they get a pass. I'm not recommending this for you. But <laughs> you should do it without telling anybody. Um, so this is a quantitative narrative analysis, just on a large scale. Uh, it should be done on an exhaustive scale. We can do it on everything. Why we should continue sampling? You can take every newspaper, just do it on, a, on everything. So this is a much smaller study. This is 100K, 100,000 articles only. The US elections. Again, a collaboration with uh, Giuseppe. So this was very much smaller. We found 2,000 actors. Um, I shown this in, in Emory already. It's pretty much, now there is a journal version, but it's kind of the same study. Um, I wonder if this works. After you apply your parser to the stream of articles coming in, you should see triplets like this. I wonder if it moves. It doesn't move. Uh, these are the kind of triplets you get from the system. Here there is an extra step. I have a, a list, semi-handmade, semi-machine-made, of all the verbs that express opposition or support between two political actors. And I only keep those. So Obama supports the unions, um, Republicans oppose Democrats. I just throw everything away other than this. So the article is coming and I just keep this stuff. Kane, Bash, Perry. And this long list of triplets can give me networks, of course, every actor being a node. So this is how we can visualize these networks. I guess this is my peacock moment, I guess. People say, oh, firework. Because I don't have another plot like his, but the, the idea is a lot of people talking about a lot of people, a lot of actors acting and interacting and <laughs> defining each other, accusing each other, criticizing, supporting, su during, this is the primary phase. So you would have still Gingrich and Perry and, and others, and Torum. This, the secondary phase, so to speak, the full election is very much more dichotomous. So, <laughs> pa pa pardon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we realize that you know, the, the, the interesting notes are the people, the voters, because everybody likes to compliment the voters and the people. You know. And so they come <coughs> up with topological absurdities because you know, two people who hate each other, they both love the voters or something. So there are interesting things. <coughs> not, not, as, no, not as big. That graph, if you analyze it with very simple software that you can do make very easily, it quickly reveals interesting structures. The the most basic structure is you can sort all the actors along a spectrum such that uh, the 
politically closest are close to each other. And so you would quickly see Romney and Republicans on one end, and then a long list, here it's been pruned, and then Obama and the others on the other side. It just separates the two parties. It shows that there is information in those verbs that we tagged as positive or negative, sufficient to separate the two parties. And then you can see why, I don't know, gay marriage is more on the Democratic side. But I don't know, sometimes we have, <coughs> we had, uh, I think, uh, Israel on the Republican side. There are, you can study those things. You can study um, uh, a, a lot of subtle things about topology. So you can study, are friends of friends really friends? Or is the enemy my enemy still really my enemy? All this kind of topological balance you can study. And I will spare it, but it's all published. And because you know the actors, you know the verbs, so you know if somebody says something positive about somebody else, is Obama a person who says positive or negative things? Is Obama very mentioned as a subject or as an object? Would you not like to be a subject of the narration, so you are the hero? Or do you want to be the object, so you tend to be not the hero, maybe the villain or something, or, or just a side dish? And uh, would you not like to be a frequently mentioned subject who says nice things? Probably these are the winners. So there is a space here you can generate. Here is subject-object ratio. Very subject-like people, very object-like topics. <coughs> very frequent, very unfrequent. So you really want to be a frequent subject. You're fighting for the space. And then you want to say nice things. And I will color uh, an actor red if they say nasty things and blue if they say ni nice things. So you mentioned before movement, shape, and color, right? There you go. Yeah. Was this Kandinsky? No, this was the other one, the Russian yeah, guy. Yeah. Kandinsky. Yeah. So here is movement and coming. This is a six-month-old campaign. All the actors fighting each other, trying to conquer that coveted corner. And uh, this is uh, quickly being defined as an object. <coughs> and uh, eventually, two are left standing. So you can compress a time series of text into a simple animation that kind of captures some information about the political relations. Um, so whatever. Roberto has shown us can be done by machines on a large scale. And we are doing that for the past 10 years. And now we are doing that uh, in a very much larger scale. The ambition is now to check how far can we, can, we, can we push it. Because it turns out a lot of the little technical problems are washed away by the large numbers. So we actually benefit. We look better if we process more data. Now, gender bias. We're interested in, in, uh, in uh, journalism. We are collaborating with a colleague at Cardiff, in the School of Journalism, and uh, they're interested in bias in the media and how the media portrays women and men and minorities and geography. And is there, I don't know, is there a preference in the media for London in respect to Scotland? I don't know. Can you find this information? Well, we tried on 2.5 million articles, <coughs> 500 newspapers for 10 months only. Now you can do it again, but we, this is an old study. We just want to show that you can find references to people. You can disambiguate and link the core references. So Mr. Obama and Senator Obama and President Obama and Barack Obama are linked. You can tell their gender, for example. And then you can tell the topic of the article. And you can tell me if certain topics have a different gender bias than other topics. This can be done. So here we have uh, taken that set of articles, 2.5 million. We found the topic. We measure the gender bias. And we can tell you that uh, uh, everything is male dominated big time, everything. But mostly sports, prices, markets, petroleum, elections. These are you know, eight men to one woman. If you go down to fashion, it's nearly equal. It's like one to one. And, sp and art and so on. So that's a study that uh, it shouldn't be surprising, but it should be done. And, and uh, because we know many things, we know from, from my colleagues at, at Cardiff, uh, I learned a lot of things about how people's perception of self changes based on what they read. And uh, if you feed this diet to a little girl, she will think that she's meant for fashion and art and not for sports and prices. Eh? Uh, I'm simplifying. But the idea is that we need to know. What's the bias in the media? Because it does tell you something about you. As newspapers, <laughs> the Sun and the tabloids have a much more balanced situation than the big traditional 
main, very serious newspapers. So now you are left with the interpretation question. Measuring things is not enough. Should we conclude that these people are much more respectful of women than these people? I don't know. This is just the finding in the text. The question becomes, maybe they're talking about show business all the time and uh, football or whatever. Or maybe women are present, but not the way they should be present and so on. So I was, uh, I was dared by a colleague in uh, Bristol, a professor, who said, uh, I dare you, I want to see if you have the courage to analyze the images. I want you to analyze the images of the tabloids. Tell me if you can get that. You know, that was difficult for me because I don't do image. I, I was never an expert in computer vision. <coughs> but text did show tabloids being much more um, uh, balanced than broadsheets in gender. And she said, make a software to see what these people are wearing. Uh, I don't have it here. We finished last week, but we can tell what people are wearing in the, in the photos today. Here, I'm in between. I'll show you just uh, gender recognition by face. Um, so we started building this infrastructure. Uh, I'll spare you the technical details. They're really boring. We can find a face in an image, and we can tell if they're a man and a woman with 95% accuracy. The way we do it is called machine learning, and you don't need to know anything else. We had to train our software on 4 million labeled images, which is not easy to even obtain 4 million faces with the gender label. That was part of the difficult part of the work. Then we just took 800,000 articles from a bunch of newspapers, 800 newspapers. And then we just uh, checked how many of them had images and how many of these images were actually faces. So we found uh, 150,000 faces, a quarter or less. The rest was difficult to tell. So now we can classify the articles by topic and the photos contained in them by gender of the face portrayed. So that's the kind of idea. This wouldn't be a face, this wouldn't be a face, this wouldn't, but this would be three, four people. What have we found? Well, also in the images, there are way more males in the Wall Street, in the BBC, in the Independent, and again, <coughs> the tabloids have more females, at least balanced. So that is a pattern. It's in text, it's in uh, images, it follows more or less the same structure uh, in the topic breakdown and in the newspaper's outlets breakdown. So that information is there. Now we'll wonder, maybe some newspapers cover some topics more. Yes, that's right. In fact, we can do this by machine. We can see uh, how many articles contain a face, for example. Uh, as you can see, if you are discussing fashion and art, there are many more faces than if you are discussing markets. So markets don't have many faces. Fashion has many faces. So we can, we can see that. It's not surprising. How many are men, how many are women, and so on. This is the topics, actually. Who talks about art more? Who talks about crime more? Well, this is crime. Um, BBC, CNN have this much crime, Metro has this much crime, surprise by the way, uh, Daily News. So you can, not much crime in Washington Post, but a lot of politics and so on. This is in the text. How about in the photos? Um, this is just preliminary stuff. The gender is not in this picture, I'll find it. Well, gender is also here, right? We discussed it, male and female, in the images. Okay, I don't have a good, I, I did have a nice picture like this, showing you the gender breakdown by outlet, but I can't find it, I'm sorry. No, I only have it by topic. Well, there is one by outlet uh, in, 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 the, in the paper we published. The point is, if you can find a face and tell their gender, and if you can understand the images in 800,000 newspapers articles by machine in a small group like mine, you can plug it onto a television video stream and just constantly monitor gender presence and topics being discussed in a TV channel constantly, all the time, full time, real time. You just can do this without people. You can just count. And that's interesting. And of course, you can do it in multiple channels. You can just see what they're talking about. You can get speech. So these things are becoming possible. And they start talking about this idea of uh, understanding culture as a whole. So such a public discourse, narrative. 
uh, in general. Good. So I don't want to go too long because there is more to say. Um, I need to talk about Twitter and what uh, uh, people preferences. This is again a study I have redone recently. So this is probably an old result, but there is a postdoc in my group doing this on a very much larger scale as we speak. If you take a newspaper, this is an Australian newspaper, you look at all the articles you can choose from. If you click on one, you've chosen it. And then they often give you a summary, a top 10 most clicked stories of the day. So you know what people are interested in. If we collect that for long enough, we have a lot of information about what people click on and what people don't click on. And then you can start comparing them and see what words make people click. Uh, we did it on 2.5 million pairs of articles, and we found for that specific outlet, the words in pink make people click, the words in black put people off. And uh, again, everything is obvious once you know it, they would say. And uh, that's what Australian readers of the paper like to click on. So that's the kind of thing, you know, people are acting without giving you data, they're not filling questionnaires. They don't, they're not in a special condition, they're just living their life. And there is this byproduct stream of information that is public, just released by the newspaper for its own purposes. That is what people call sometimes data in the wild. It's already existing out there. You just have to capture it. You don't have to do anything else. So a lot of work in artificial intelligence is about exploiting data already existing in the wild. The photos are there anyway, the clicks are there anyway, Twitter is flowing anyway. What can you do with it? So this is people's preferences. And then we can model preferences. We can compare outlets whose readers have similar preferences. We can make a similarity comparison and show that the readers of New York Times and LA Times like similar things and they're very different than the readers of Reuters. So, well, I'll, I was going to skip, but if you start distinguishing between articles containing public affairs, and non-public affairs. Public affairs being markets and finance and foreign policy, and the rest being crime and sport and entertainment. You can start making a ratio. And uh, you see, the most appealing outlets do not contain public affairs. And the least appealing outlets contain a lot of public affairs. This is what people click on. So that's something you can get out of the data. Good. So. I'll skip this. It's a technical part you don't want to see. And these are the words. Forget. Good. So I just told you what, what I've been doing, which is just collect a lot of data and analyze it by machine. How about Twitter? Twitter tells us something about what people talk about. I am in the middle of a project with Giuseppe right now, which is not quite finished, about this past UK election. And I don't have anything to show you. So I show you an a much older study. It's embarrassing because uh, Roberto has seen it twice probably by now. So you are, you are allowed to sleep. The new study though is, is exciting. You Let's always see. keep me awake now. <laughs> ah, maybe I put the photo there to motivate. Um, <laughs> ah, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's for you, you know. So this is how fast Twitter data comes into the, into the machine. There are many per second, you know, uh, all the time. We, we, we are monitoring the 54 largest towns and cities of the UK, and we don't get everything. We have a system of sampling every few seconds and getting the most recent 100 tweets. So it's a fairly dense, but not exhaustive collection. Um, once you have Twitter, you have to start asking, now what do I do with this data? These are mi hundreds of millions of messages for a long time. Again, this is old. But my collection paper has been going on non-stop for many, many years now. So we have all this enormous amount of data. Now we've been using it to understand where there are flu outbreaks. We could understand where it's raining. We can do a bunch of things like this. But what is exciting is maybe something a bit different, which is uh, how do people feel? Can you make lists of words that are indicating anger or sadness or fear or joy in, in the readers? And the idea is uh, you can be sloppy because you have hundreds of millions of these things. You know, you're just looking for big, gigantic changes and trends. And these lists exist, both for marketing purposes and for clinical purposes. So we tried various of them. So if you look at joy, 
And again, this is stopping in 2012, but we have the new joy list for 2000 up to 15. It's pretty much the same. We just produced it recently. You have uh, changes in the joy level. Christmas and New Year are reliably full of joyous messages because of the greeting messages that are confused by the system as indicating joy, which they don't probably. Uh, Easter, same. Valentine, same. These are just messages containing words in the joy list, but they show at least our system is somehow capturing that. If you ignore those messages, you're left with the remaining signal, which is not greetings. And you have changes in the average. The blue line changes. There are moments when joy is higher, sometimes it's less. By the way, I found 24-hour um, patterns and circadian changes periodically, so there is that component too. If you look at anger mm -hmm. and you ignore all the Halloween things, then you are left with these change points. A gigantic change point here and another one here that are really statistically significant. And this one was coincident with the announcement of the spending cuts in this country and that created a lot of anger. And this was the week before and after the big riots in London that summer 2011. So these are gigantic measures on millions of people but to some extent, they reflect events on the ground. Uh, people may not be discussing the spending cuts. They may just be using more angry words anyway, at this point, after. So, again, you may start combining information from images, from newspapers, from Twitter. We are looking at webcams in this moment uh, with street images and analyzing that content. You can start observing society in so many ways and obtaining information on this enormous scale that would be very hard to obtain otherwise. And we've done study, uh, studies, I didn't show you, in, in 24 different languages by using machine translation and then analyzing the output. And they are very reliable um, patterns in, in, in the content. So if you want to visualize, because beauty and visualization, and uh, you said, uh, right, uh, Roberto, uh, Measuring is only a part of the journey. You need to visualize it and then make sense of it. And this is my attempt. No, don't tell me. Oh, this is so annoying. I have a, my little attempt. I'll find it. I have various versions of this presentation, so one of these versions will be fine. Um, Probably here. So you can animate and visualize the changes in public mood over those four years. Um, I'm moving the, the, the focus here. I'm turning those five numbers, four numbers into a fake expression. That's the face you want to wait for here. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. And then it goes on to the riots. It will look a little bit angrier, hopefully. I think the riots are coming in a, in, a, in a short time. There you go. This is the face of the riots. So what can we say? That there is a huge amount of information out there. Maybe calling it data is not the right word. Although now we are in the data science phase, people want data. This is just a lot of content in the media, information, side information, contextual information, just waiting to be integrated and understood. And understanding will come from us, the human. But if there is a macroscopic trend across the globe, across many decades, you cannot capture it unless you have a 
tool like this. I, I think this is for me like a telescope. It allows me to see things that couldn't be seen without it. What we do with it, it's the job of the scientist. But we have this uh, opportunity today to, to start thinking about social science in this way. And by the way, this can affect the humanities. We can do history in a very different way. And we are trying to, right now, we have the right data for history. And we are working very hard on history. And the normal, let's say, the humanities in terms of art, why not? It is a bit strange, but there are people who are working on this. And uh, I am, it's not my first thought, but you know, at UCLA, there is Franco Moretti uh, proposing the notion of distant reading. And he looks at uh, large scale patterns in, in, uh, in creative content. If I had to do something in that space, which I haven't done yet much, I would like to actually test props theories, narrative theories. Can you always reliably detect the protagonist, the antagonist, and all the, the cast of characters that props knows should be found? Can you do that by machine? Can you find the wizard, the dispatcher, mm -hmm. the queen, the princess, the classic? Well, I, 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 have a I haven't done it. I shouldn't say, but I think it's possible. And then you could align, perhaps, narratives. You could say, well, you know, the, the way we talk about elections is not unlike the Odyssey. Maybe we are portraying Obama as a Ulysses or something, because we would have this information. So I would like to look at um, literature in that way, but not for the sake of skipping the reading, actually to see if you can compare high-level narrative structures across many different types of data. And that I have not done, and I, I'm going to try if I get the funding. That's all. Thank you very much.